that I decided to try to detox myself. I can remember my ex-wife coming out of the bedroom and I was sleeping on the couch at the time. So, but I was in the, in the living room, standing on top of a chair, listening to the wall because I, the TV was off, but I could still hear the TV playing. Um, yeah, that, I mean, it's, it, it sounds like something you would think, man, that sounds like some, some heavy drug withdrawal right there. No, no drugs at all. That was, that was years and years of alcoholism. You know, when, when, when I try to stop on my own, it throws, it, it throws my body into fit. Back to season two of the Jerry to Love podcast. I'm your host, Victoria Holloway, and you are listening to Beauty from Ashes, where I have guests on to share how God brought them out of deeply painful situations and turned them into something beautiful. Today's guest is Ian Arnold, and he's going to be sharing about how God rescued him from an alcohol addiction. I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, my name is Ian Arnold, and I am a, well, I'm an alcoholic and a follower of Christ. Not necessarily in that order, in fact, the opposite of that order. First a child of God and then a, a recovering alcoholic. And um, <clears throat> I'm 43 years old and um, I've been sober for almost three years. I, ha I am divorced. I have three little girls, a five-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 16-year-old. So... That's uh, that definitely keeps it interesting. Yeah, keeps you busy. <laughs> Absolutely. All girls too. That's right. Deep, uh, go deep ahead. trouble. I'm yeah. In deep trouble. So tell me about like, um, you say you're an alcoholic, mm -hmm. you're a sober alcoholic. So, yeah. um, tell me about kind of how that started for you and just like the beginning stages of, of that. Um, it's I think it started off as a pretty innocent behavior, um, you know, kind of doing the taboo, the thing that you weren't supposed to be doing. And that's, um, you know, I didn't always gravitate towards that, but I, um, I eventually did, you know, and something that, that started out as, as innocent fun ended up being, uh, I mean, living in absolute hell. I mean, it's, uh, it was a, it wasn't a fast progression. It was slow and, um, hard and painful. For not just me, but for what I put a lot of people through. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's a, you know, I try to remember that it's a, it is hard and it's it's difficult for me to have to turn and you know look at the things that I did. Um, but it's necessary, you know. It really is necessary. I, I, you know, God tells me that you know everything that's happened to this point and those things that seem like they could have been the worst days of your life are. You know, those were your turning points and those, um, you know, it got you to right here. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy right now knowing that I'm living in his will. So that's, um, that's comforting. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, did it start out for you? Like, I think a lot of things that we end up being very bad for us start out very innocent, like you say. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you have like a history of alcoholism in your family? Was it just like something you just picked up on or uh no family history that's um which is interesting because you know the alcoholism the the science looking at it from the scientific approach it is very genetic mm -hmm. and hereditary um i did you know my my story is a lot different than a lot of other people's stories you know um i was not raised around alcohol i never saw people drinking i um I just didn't, you know, I had an uncle who it was like, oh yeah, that guy's an alcoholic, but you know, he didn't, there was no drinking around us. I didn't have a bad childhood or youth at all. I was, um, I was not raised around it. That is my, you know, it's really disgusting behavior to both of my parents. They just, they, they don't do it. I don't know why. I think my dad's dad had a little bit of history of some alcohol use, but nothing prolonged or, you know, no, no genetic reasoning. I don't think, um, I, I think I definitely seeked that out. I don't, I don't know. I don't know exactly what I was looking for. Maybe just to be a part of, um, 
and I was, it's weird because I was already a part of, but I wasn't happy with what I was a part of, you know, I wanted to be with the, with the, um, the people who seemed like they were running with the cool crowd. So, yeah. um, and that, that wasn't, that, that wasn't really who I was, but I, I, I made sure that I, I got myself in there. It was almost like I was afraid I was missing out on something. You know, I always had that feeling that oh, I was no. missing out. Oh, yeah. the FOMO bad. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know why, like, you know, you asked me and I, I try to think of back to my first introduction to alcohol and that was, you know, me sneaking into my grandfather's refrigerator and swiping a, swiping a cold one out of there. And, um, man, that, you know, like I said before, and it really innocent behavior, I think that turned into something that, you know, I don't think, I don't think a lot of people know what the end game can be with that. And, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of why I like to, um, you know, like to share my story and share my, you know, what we say in AA is experience, strength, and hope. And that's what we do is we share where we've been and what, you know, what's happened to us. And that's how we kind of relate. Um, you know, the, the passing it on part of, of this recovery that I'm involved in is very, very important to me. It's kind of like the, um, you know, you can't keep it unless you give it away. And I, yeah. I really believe that too. It keeps it fresh for you. And, and helping others. I mean, you know, that's the, that's, that's one of the most important commandments, you know, as, yeah. as love God and, you know, help others. That's, yeah. that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So. Yeah. Um, so when do you feel like it got really bad? Because, you know, you started out just doing it kind of for fun to fit in and then it turned into something much worse. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, it did start out as just kind of a couple of beers here and there and, Um, but you know, it wasn't long before I, you know, I kind of recognized that everybody else would, would stop and everybody else, their behavior was a lot different than mine. Um, I didn't understand the full gravity of it until I did get sober, but you know, I, I have a a larger reaction to alcohol whenever it enters my body and it's just, I get more, 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 you know, and that's, I've, I've never had the thought in my head, well, that's enough alcohol. I've never had that because it's a switch that gets flipped inside me. And, um, yeah. And it took me, it took me a long time to realize that even though I could see that my drinking and my drinking patterns were different. Um, before I was even 21 years old, I had gotten a driving under the influence of alcohol. Um, I was pulled over and given a breathalyzer and I only blew, I had only drank, I had like really, only drank a couple of beers, but I was under 21. So, um, you know, that was, a I would, that was before I was 21 years old, you know, and that should have been a, that should have been a, a, a big red flag should have been a red flag for me that, you know, this is, um, this is not normal, but, um, and I, um, got married in 2006, but, um, my ex-wife got pregnant with our first child in 2005 and drinking was, it was definitely an overindulgence for me. It was not a, not a normal activity. I, I, I'd gotten pretty close to drinking every single day. I, I, I would think that I probably was drinking every single day. Um, there was drug use in my past, even though that has never really been my, you know, it all, everything leads back to drinking for me. So, um, and after that first child was born, I decided, you know, my, my, I remember my ex-wife specifically saying, you know, this is, this is what we're doing and we're, you know, I'm going to have this child. We're not married, but you know, all this, all this childishness has got to stop, you know, and all the partying and hanging out with buddies that I was still running with and from high school. And, um, and I thought that I would be able to do that. And it lasted for probably two months and then turned into what I consider the beginning of my alcoholic drinking. So, um, and what that was, was just drinking every single day. Um, it would get much worse than that. That was a, um, it was, it was not bad then, but I would, you know, I'm sitting up by myself drinking every night and, um, you know, waking up the next morning and looking at that garbage can and like, Oh my gosh, all, all those empty beer cans, you know, it was a garbage can full of empty beer cans. 
I knew that I knew that there was a problem then. And I did, and I'm I I was probably twenty six or twenty seven years old, and um, and it just you know it it turned in that started a pattern of me drinking by myself, which was um, which was the way that I I did it. I didn't I don't drink normally, so when you see television commercials of people sitting around a campfire, you know, and drug, that is not how I drink. You know, that's it's I. I'll back up and say, I'm, first of all, I'm not, I'm not pro or anti-alcohol. Alcohol is something that's there. Um, my kids will tell you that I'm probably anti-alcohol because I'm like, if you ever drink, you know, I, it's, it terrifies me that, you know, passing on that, that thing that I know is genetic, but, um, it's, a. you know, I don't think it's inherently evil. And I know that there are people who, who do that and, you know, nor, I've heard it equated to normal people start drinking and they're like, whoa, you know, they get that feeling. They're like, I better slow down. You know, well, my reaction is opposite. And, um, and it's a scary thing. It really is. Um, it took me a long time to, to realize, you know, you know, what was going on. And that was that if I start drinking, I am not able to stop until, you know, one of several, yeah, until one of several things happen, and that is either I end up in jail, I end up passed out somewhere, or I end up, you know, somewhere I'm not supposed to be, so, um, it was, it, it was awesome finally realizing what was happening. I, the alcoholism, like I said, was a slow progression, and it took about 20 years for it to reach a point to where I was drinking around the clock, 24 hours a day, um, but it happened. It um, I get like I was saying those um, those caution, you know, those caution flags, caution lights. I could see them everywhere. Um, I would, you know, by this time I had moved and up to Jefferson, Georgia, which was not not good for my drinking at all. It was still pretty rural up there, and I started you know, drinking every single day. If it was the weekend, I would start drinking. I, you know, I'd try to wait till lunchtime and. Um, yeah. And that progression just, you know, it just picked up. Um, you, there, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, do you feel like you mentioned several times that like you knew that it was bad and you knew that it was like red, the red flags were going off. Mm. Do you feel like you felt like you couldn't stop on your own? Like, was it something that kept you from seeking help at the beginning? I don't think I would have been willing to recognize that I couldn't stop on my own, I would lie to myself yeah. and um, say, you know what, if there's if there comes a time where I need to stop doing this, I'm going to stop. That was an absolute lie. Um, there was no way I could stop. It took, it took rehab for me to stop this past time. Um, so you brought up your family um, and you're, you know, you have three daughters. You're just talking about how you I just had your first one when your ex-wife was like, it's time to stop. So how did that affect your family as a whole throughout um, all of the years that you were addicted to alcohol? Um, the effect on my family was was terrible, especially my mom and dad. Um, I can still see, you know, whenever the phone rings at my parents' house, if I'm over there, you know, my mom jumps. And there's just, there's, there's lasting effects, you know, from that. Um, it, you know, I'll, ref I'll go back to, you know, I do have a daughter and then my wife and I, we moved and had a, had a second daughter. And, you know, those, I always, I remember her being born and saying to myself, this is, you know, this is it. This is what's going to change it. it. It never did. You know, it was always back to that old, um, place where I was, you know, the only place where I was comfortable, which was inebriated. Um, it, the effect on my family has is, is something that tears me up. You know, we, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we do things where we call, you know, making amends. Well, you know, the amends that I have to make to my parents is going to have to be, a, you know, just just me staying sober, you know, that what we kind of call a living amends. Um, my dad would, I, I don't know, you know, if I, my first of all, my dad's not a Christ follower. My mom is. I didn't. I didn't grow up in church necessarily. My mom would take me when she went, you know, a couple of times a month or something like that. But my dad is not, 
is not a Christ follower, but it's it's strange because you know he he has definitely shown me how to love. He has. Um, if I had done, let me tr- let me rephrase that. If someone else had done to my parents what I did to my parents, I would I would I would hate that person. I would hate them. Um, and that's you know that's kind of what you get with alcoholism. It's a uh, it's a very very selfish you know disease. It is. I I look back at that and it's it's you know it's sometimes when I think about it, it's hard to live with that. It is. Um, I got married in 2006 and um we had you know we had dreams we had healthy dreams i think um of just raising a family you know we moved out to jefferson and bought a couple of acres and a house and um when that happened it just you know my drinking just kept increasing and increasing i got a job um working for a distributor for a outdoor power equipment parts and I just kept getting promoted at that job, you know, and my drinking just kept increasing and increasing. And I, I don't know why or how that worked that way, but, um, we were happy, you know, there was a time whenever we were happy and I, you know, my drinking completely destroyed that. I took what was a, you know, what was a happy marriage, what was a happy, you know, parent child relationship. And I destroyed all that. Um, Drinking, whenever I am a feeding alcoholic, takes precedence over everything. It doesn't matter. I can tell you that I love my kids, and I do love my kids, but I choose alcohol over them every time if it's in my body. So, um, it's a destroyer of families, alcohol is. There's, um, I look at other people that I know and people who are using alcoholics and see what it does to their family and hear about, you know, this same pattern that I went through, which was night after night of, are you drinking again? No, I'm not drinking, you know, and it just turned into a huge argument. Um, it, um, I, it, it completely, I, let me, not it, I completely burned, you know, that happy relationship, the dreams of the woman that I married and the woman that I loved at one time. And, uh, you know, I burned them to the ground. Um, that is, you know, that, that's not easy to live with. I still look at um, repercussions of that every single day. And that's, you know, the destruction that it causes my kids from not having their dad living in the house with them. And it just, it's, um, you know, looking back, that is, that is definitely my biggest regret is what, what it's done to my family. My, my parents, for some reason, after 20 or 30 years of this, um, you know, having to come rescue me, you know, fix something that I broke or, you know, just other, you know, come resolve uh, the relationship between my ex-wife and I, you know, my dad would, and mom would have to come over there and, and deal with it all the time. And it's, um, it's terrible. I don't know why after all that was over, they were the ones that were still standing there and loved me, but, you know, got. I think it's pretty neat though. Um, just your testimony in general for two two different reasons is um, that like your parents are such like a example of like Christ's love for us like they pursue after you even after you constantly you know as you said 20 30 years of alcoholism and they're still pursuing after you to be there for you and that's exactly what Jesus does for us absolutely um, so I think that's really cool and even to hear that um, like your dad's not a Christ follower, I think kind of like sometimes we think like, oh, in order to be used by God, you have to go to church every Sunday and read the Bible every single day and pray all the time and only listen to worship music. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like God can use God can use a donkey to speak to you like he did in the Bible. So he can use anybody and everybody. So even if you're not a Christ believer, I think that that's, you know, pretty uh, neat in your testimony as well. Um, and then I also just want to say that I think it's just really inspiring that you're being so open about your failure mm. as a parent. Because even though you say like, oh, if you did what, if somebody did to you what you did to your to your family, you would hate them. Mm. But I bet like, if somebody did that to you, you would have so much compassion and love for them because you've been there, right. you know, and you know exactly what they're going through. Um, so I think somebody out there watching this 
could be possibly struggling with that guilt and shame that you feel or you have felt Mm -hmm. and not know what to do with it. And here you are a living example of like there's life beyond that breaking point, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, that guilt and shame was was a huge part of why I was doing what I was doing. I, you know, I didn't know that at the time, but you know, when you're, when, when I'm hiding alcohol and, you know, doing just, it was, it was incredibly shameful and it didn't have to be as bad as I'm as bad as it got. Um, because you know, it was not normal behavior, but you know, shameful, I don't know. You know, the more that I learn about this disease, I, um, I, I do start to have more compassion for people. You know, it's, um, it's a, it's a weird line that I walk there being a member in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, we have kind of a sponsee sponsor relationship and I can only imagine what my sponsor was dealing with, you know, whenever I was just coming into the program, because man, some of these guys, I'm just like, why don't you get it? You know, why can't you just stop? And it's, um, I have to remember, you know, that's me, that's me. And, um, you know, just like you were saying, Christ follower or not, it's, um, you know, I can look at somebody and think to myself now, you know, that part, that's me, you know, I've go through those same exact things. Am I going to, am I going to confront this situation with love or am I going to do it with fear? Because it's a, um, I just, I don't believe that I'm going to be able to stay sober and not be helping other men. That's just, um, that's the way that I was taught coming up through this program and, it's um you know it's going to be instrumental in me and in me staying sober um it's been, i've had an, i've had so many great opportunities already to just connect with people um you know not only through aa but there's you know i've had other people say you know what well, he didn't struggle with alcohol you know maybe he can help you and my uh, my first reaction is always oh gosh i got to do this again you know but it's like oh you better back up and remember where you come from Um, that's a, that's a huge thing for me because I, I look back and think to myself, what if when I was at my lowest point and I reached out for help, you know, from another alcoholic, if there wouldn't have been anybody there, I just, I don't know what I would have done. I really don't. I just, I don't think that it would have turned out the way that it did. Um, so I know we had talked um, the other day about like kind of the physical oh. effects of your of what happens to you when um, you are addicted to alcohol. So I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about how it affected your body. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think alcohol kind of gets an easy rap as not you know being a drug or being something that's as bad as other things to do. But um, the effects that it had on my body were 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 terrible. I um. You know, it started out as I would go to the doctor and I would know that, you know, I'd, from drinking my, body, my my back would hurt my lower back. And I would always think to myself, well, this is kidney failure. This is what happens to alcoholics. You know, you don't you don't live a long, healthy life being an alcoholic. And I would go to the doctor and, I'd, and I'd, she'd say, no, I think you just have a pinched nerve in your back. Here's some pain medication, you know. So, of course, I would take that because I was an addict and um, it uh it was, it was really, really hard on my body. I felt like I was pretty close to death near the end of my, um, of my active alcoholism. The, the physical part was somewhat troublesome. The mental part is what really, is what really, um, is what really got to me. I, Uh, paranoid delusions is the only, is, is what comes to my mind because I was a I was a paranoid delusional person. That's um, that's all there is to it. I I would try to quit drinking. Like if my ex wife or whenever I was married at the time would say, you know, this is you've got to stop this. You've got to stop it. So I'd try to quit for a couple of days. And the things that would happen to my body when I was going through alcohol withdrawals, my mind when I was going through alcohol withdrawals are. It's, it's terrifying. It really is. Um, when I went to rehab, they said, um, you know, you're going to need to take these anti-convulsants and things like that. And I was like, well, what is this? You know, you would think it would be something for like a heroin addict. It's not. It's for, it's for people who are withdrawing from alcohol, which they say 
is the second worst withdrawal that they see at rehab. You know, people getting up and having seizures and it just, it's, um, it's crazy that, you know, the other things that come to mind are, you know, I, my grandmother died six days, I think before I got sober and I can remember going back to her funeral and, um, and trying to shave my face and they alcoholism whenever you're withdrawing they have you know if you're a, if you're a pretty bad alcoholic who drinks copious amounts of alcohol every day you have what are called DTs which are it stands for delirium trim, delirium tremors or delirium tremors or something like that and um it's it's violent shaking in your body and um you know, I think uh, I think about seeing somebody throw a fish out of water and it just flop in there on the because that's you know that's what would happen to my body. I would, you know, there was a couple of times where I would come to or wake up and be like, "What? You know, what was that?" You know, and I had passed out. My my blood pressure was all over the place. Um, I was pre diabetic already. I was hearing voices. My um, you know, one of those times that I decided to try to detox myself, I can remember my ex-wife coming out of the bedroom and I was sleeping on the couch at the time. So, but I was in the, in the living room, standing on top of a chair, listening to the wall because I, the TV was off, but I could still hear the TV playing. Um, yeah, that, I mean, it's, it, it sounds like something you would think, man, that sounds like some, some heavy drug withdrawal right there. No, no drugs at all. That was, That was years and years of alcoholism, you know, when, when, when I try to stop on my own, it throws, it, it throws my body into fits. So it's not only the physical pain of, you know, your kidneys, my ankles were swelling, you know, the, the physical part was, was easy. I had, it had driven me to, to the gates of insanity. I was, I was standing at the gates of insanity and. You know, me trying to shave at my grandmother's funeral, I had cuts all over the inside of my neck and, um, you know, and that was a, that, that funeral and that time, you know, my father and I spent a a good bit of time alone. That, um, that was, that was a turning point for me. Um, you know, my dad could see what was going on and I, I asked my dad, I said, I'm not going to be able to go to this funeral unless you go get me some alcohol because I can't stop. I physically cannot stop you know, shaking and, um, even worse than shaking. I don't know. It was twitching and it it was, it was, it was, um, I'm sure it was painful for him to watch. It, it was, it was terrible. I, I looked at my dad and said, dad, you're going to have to go get me some alcohol so that I can go to this funeral and do what I need to do, you know, to get, you know, to get through that because it's about me. Right. Um, you know, do what I need to do. And I can remember my dad looking at me and saying, you know, I, I'm going to go do this for me, for you. And he said, I want you to know right now that right, I'm going to have to look at your mother and lie to your mother about where I'm going. And he said, out of almost 50 years of marriage, I, I don't lie to your mother. So that lets you know where we are right now. And he looked at me and said, <clears throat> we were in Mississippi at the time and looked at me and said, you know, when we get back, this is over this is over. So, um, I could, you know, for the, I guess it was because I had not been drinking for a couple of days for the first time I could see what I, what, what I'd been doing, you know, that I had been absolutely tearing my family apart and it was continuing until then. I, um, I went into rehab six days after that and, you know, I had, I had a, a spiritual experience that was like something that I've never had before. You know, I, I, um, I used to sit while I was drinking with my Bible in one hand and with, you know, a beer in the other hand saying, God, why won't you take this from me? You know, you see what this is doing. Why won't you take this from me? Meanwhile, you know, I'm sitting over here drinking and reading the Bible and crying and listening to, you know, third day and, you know, just boo and God, why won't you take this from me? You know, because it, I, I'm sitting there and I'm just, I'm thinking to myself, God, you know, I'll surrender, but we're going to do this my way. You know, 
I'll surrender, but here's the conditions. Um, and couldn't couldn't figure out why why God wouldn't help me, you know. <clears throat> um, and He was helping me the whole time. He really was. Um, you know, whenever I went into that rehab for the last time, I finally, you know, I was I had to. I, I feel like that physical separation from society is ex- is exactly what it took and what it what I needed to to have the experience, you know, and to get real with God. And I um. I did, you know, and I surrendered there and I, I can, I, I hear that, you know, that small voice in my head all the time saying, go, go get your Bible, go get it, open it. And, um, and that's what I did. And it just, I, for the first time ever was, was done. You know, I felt like that. that. Yeah. So talk, can you explain just a little bit more like spiritual experience? Like, what do you mean by that? Um, was, I had, was it introduced to you? Like, was it, was it something because you talked about having a Bible? So was it something that you kind of, it was, it was something that I was familiar with hearing about it in AA. Um, you know, the, the people who wrote the, and came up with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, his name was Bill Wilson and Bob, um, you know, he says that without a spiritual experience, it can't happen. I don't know why that happened. I've I've had many spiritual experiences in my life. God, I think, has said, this is, you know, this is is not how we're going to do this. This You got to turn, you know, you got to change your ways and uh, repent. And I I never would do that. I wouldn't do it. You know, I would tell God no. And I think that had me on the run for a long time. That particular spiritual experience I don't I don't know why or how it happened when it did but I just had a feeling that I haven't I hadn't had in a long time it was a it was a sense of peace and it was a sense of being where I was supposed to be doing what I was supposed to be doing and you know I th- I think I look back at it, like I said before, you know, and think about all those hard times and how bad that was and just, you know, see those as those were my turning points. That's where, that's where God was. Yeah, those, he met you at, yeah. And I don't even know how to explain really what happened except for saying that I had a, I had a peace and serenity that I had not had before. Um, I had the, the feeling of, this is done. This is over. And I don't, you know, I think the biggest part of that spiritual experience was me asking God to remove that, you know, is that I, you know, I know that this is not going to be something that I can just sit on my rear end and hope to, to battle, but God, I I need you to take it from me. I need, you know, it was a, it was a mental obsession is is you know coupled with a with a physical addiction and that mental obsession was from the time I woke up until the time I went to bed I thought about drinking I thought about my next drink I thought about where I was going to buy and it just it um I I don't even know what other word to use to explain it 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 was my it was my god that I mean that's what a you know that's a, you love that's how I love God now. It's how, how I craved and sought after that, that next high. And, um, when I asked God to relieve me of that, that weight, I guess, um, getting lifted off my shoulders of not waking up, not thinking about it every waking minute to not thinking about it at all. I did. I, I have no excuse, no reason know nothing to have a lack of faith, you know, because people talk about seeing miracles. And if you go from being completely obsessed and addicted to something like that, where you have to have it every minute of every day. And then the next morning I woke up and that was gone. That, I mean, that was as spiritual as it got for me. I didn't, I, I, I couldn't, and I don't thank God enough for that because it, that's, you know, that's what saved me. I don't even think about alcohol or 
I don't think about that drink being a solution for anything in my life anymore. I, I know that the most insane thought in the world to me, and it, it happens sometimes. It, I mean, they pop up when I see billboards or commercials. I'm like, oh, well, that would be, nope, I don't drink. I can't drink. Um, but yeah, the weight of that bondage being lifted off of me was was incredibly spiritual and and it freed me up yeah. to have a life again so yeah i think oh man that's so awesome like um just like it makes me think back to when like i'm not an alcoholic but it makes me think back to when i made that choice for myself and it really is such a personal thing like we can sit here all day and talk about our personal relationship with god and share with people but until you experience it for yourself it's just like he he's so personal with us, you know. So it really touches you in like a whole new way. And just t- hearing you talk about, you know, feeling that weight lifted off. When I gave my heart to the Lord, I went to the altar call, and I was going through like a lot um, personally and with my family and stuff like that. And I just I didn't go to church either. Um, so I remember, you know, I raised I'm raised in a Christian home. You know, my dad he's very spiritual and constantly giving advice and wisdom and stuff. And my mom's the same way, and I just reached a point in life where I didn't want to go to church or be around Christians or do anything like that. I was so over it, and I was still in high school, and um, I remember going to ch- tell my parents I was going to go to church, and they were like, okay, <laughs> you know, and then um, just sobbed the whole service because I was just, like, so overwhelmed and just didn't know what else to do, and then feeling physically lighter like I genuinely felt like a weight was lifted off my chest like I could stand up straighter afterward and you know and so it's just like it it really is so freeing to be in a relationship with the Lord like the freedom that you that you feel it's like there's that saying it's like you don't know um you don't know that you're breathing toxic air until you breathe fresh air or something like that and it's so true like you don't realize how bad it is until you experience Jesus and then you're like, wow, this is really nice. Mm -hmm. Like, you know? Um, so I, I think that that's really inspiring. Um, so you said, you know, how long were you an addict? 30, 25, 20, I think 23 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Until I was 40, one, 40. So, yeah. So how was, how is life for you now, sober? Oh, I, it's unbelievable, you know, and kind of talking back to um, that relationship that we were just talking about, I, you know, I always sat in church and I would go to church and sit there and it was almost like there was, there was that buffer that I was putting between, between the Lord and myself was, you know, yes, God, I'll surrender everything. I'll give everything to you, except for that one thing mm-hmm. in my life, except for that one thing that I want to hold on to, you know, that thing that's destroying my family and killing my body and causing me all this pain. Um, you know, I, I want to be fully surrendered, God, but I'm not I, I'm not letting go of that thing. I, I don't even know how to describe how it feels sitting. Well, it's a... It's a... Um, you know, it's almost like the wire's been cut between you and God. Is how it, is how I how I feel like it is. Um, that relationship is there, but it's it's you know I'm not doing my part. Of course, He's doing His part, and I'm not doing mine. Um, being able to go to church now and worship and have that you know just that that ultimate intimacy. It's it's me and God. You know, when I'm when I'm in that space. Um, and yeah, it's incredibly freeing. I mean, that's, you know, and that's where it starts for me. Mm-hmm. The, I have, I was introduced to a new church and a new pastor who has just been an unbelievable teacher for me, um, out in, you know, out in Loganville where I live and they they had a recovery program there. So my girlfriend now, and I have been, um, you know, pretty heavily involved in that recovery program. They, they send people to us, you know, at the church who are struggling with addiction and stuff like that, especially her. There's a, um, there's a huge need for, for women to, to 
you know, reach out in this recovery thing for other women who need it. Um, which is how we stick with it in AA. It's men with the men, women with the women. And she's, she's been an incredible blessing in my life. Um, you know, God has also shown me and, you know, and tells me you're, you're where you're supposed to be with you when you're with that woman. She has just got the, the biggest heart I've ever seen. Um, so, you know, getting involved in that church, getting involved with the, you know, my girlfriend and then in the recovery program at the church has all been instrumental. I try to stay knee deep, you know, in the, in the middle of the bed with AA, I'm really involved. Um, sometimes I think over involved, but, uh, you know, it's almost every week I have something which is either a committee obligation, an obligation of my group, you know, and that, that keeps me busy. God's first recovery is second in my life. You know, I, I wake up every single morning because of what I've been taught in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and I hit my knees. I thank God for letting me wake up sober again. I tell him how grateful I am and I tell him to relieve me of me, you know, uh, man, alcoholism is a ugly, ugly, of course, deadly disease. And, um, you know, I wish that there was something or someone, actually, I don't wish that, but you know, there's a lot of people who have family things like we were talking about earlier to blame on that. I, I am solely, solely responsible for what has happened to me, you know, and what has happened in my life, the destroying of that family, you know, the fact that I have to pick up the piece that, you know, the pieces need to be picked up for these children who had no say so in the matter. Um, but you know, today I can deal with all that. Uh, I have a strong group of men around me. I am involved at church, which is something that I never would have, you know, I've always heard them ask for, Oh, if somebody could work the parking lot, you know, and I'd slink out the back again, you know, now I'm out there directing traffic in the parking lot. I want to be involved. And, you know, not only that, but, um, you know, what I think is probably the greatest benefit and where I get the, you know, a ton of joy is my children, you know, from the moment that I had my first child, you know, and all three of them, um, you know, God, I, I, I feel like I'm supposed to be a dad. That's what I'm, that's what, you know, I'm, I'm here to help people recover from alcoholism or whatever, you know, I'm here to, here to serve God and I'm, I'm here to be a dad. And I feel like that's exactly what, what God wants me to do. And I can't, I can't describe to you the, the relationship that I have with my kids. It's, it's unbelievable. I finally feel like that I am getting to be the person that I, I'm supposed to be, getting to be the person that God wants me to be. Um, you know, I pray every day that it's not my will and it's his. And I feel like that if I can stay surrendered and I can stay living that way, that I just don't want it to stop. So my answer to the question is my life today compared to what it was three years ago is is a miracle. It, it, um, I've, I've witnessed a miracle, you know, not only through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, but you know, through that, through that relationship. Yeah. So with Christ, yeah. my last question is just if you, anybody out there watching that or listening that might be in a very similar situation to you, whether it be alcohol or drugs or anything, um, what would you say encouraging to them to get them through this time? There is hope. You know, I, all I can say to you is that I, I felt like that I was at the absolute bottom of the barrel, you know, and, you know, it just kept getting deeper and deeper. And I didn't, you know, I was the one with the shovel, you know, I had to stop digging in order for me to be able to get my way or for, in order for God to be able to help me. I had to stop digging. Um, there is hope. Nothing's ever hopeless. This, you know, I, I look back now that I've got a couple of years of sobriety under my belt and I think, whoa, man, that took, you know, why did I wait so long to do that? None of that matters now, you know, none of it matters because I can look at myself in the mirror and 
You know, I can look at my kids in the eye. I can look at other people in the eye and, you know, don't, don't give up. But, um, it's hard and it takes, it takes work. It really does. That's the, you know, that's, that's the part of this that really scared me as I thought to myself, man, I'm going to have to really work for something now. And, um, but it's worth it. It's totally worth it. I don't know how I can explain to someone being given your life back or being given a second chance, but it's out there and it's waiting for you. Asking for help is not easy, but man, if, um, you know, there's programs out there and there's programs that are available, reach out. Um, you know, they say a sick mind can't heal a sick mind. And I, I really do believe that you have to get your, first of all, you're battling a disease, you know, and you've got to get with somebody that understands this. And there are programs out there, whether it be Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, Celebrate Recovery. There are people out there who will help you reach out for help. Well, thank you, Ian, so much for coming on. Um, I think it's just great. I, I really do feel like this podcast is going to be like whoever it touches, whether it be one person or hundreds of thousands. Like, um, so I, I think it's really courageous that you came on and, and shared your story. And I think it's going to be really inspiring for a lot of people out there because, like you said, um, alcohol, is, I don't know if it's different in, in other countries, but in America, it's like, it's just not viewed the same and, and a lot of people don't really view it as something you can get an addiction to. So I think there's a lot of people out there that are probably struggling that don't even realize that it's as bad as, as it is, just like you were. So thank you so much for, for sharing. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode of the Dairy to Love podcast. I hope it blessed you and challenged you. Make sure you visit the description below for all our helpful links. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any new content from us. And follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook so you can stay updated with everything we have going on. And we'll see you next week for an all-new episode of the Dairy to Love podcast.